The whole world is sick. Are you worried about America? I am. Believe the impossible and you can do the incredible. Welcome to another episode of The Catholic Patriot, and I am joined once again by Ted Flynn. Uh, he's the co-founder of Signs and Wonders of Our Times, and he's also the author of numerous books and countless art, uh, just articles in gen- general. Um, but his latest one, uh, Diabolical Disorientation, is something that is worth having in everybody's, not just on your, your desktop, but really reading it so you can understand what's going on today. So I am delighted to have him back, and I'm going to invite him right on right now and say, hey, Ted, welcome. Welcome back. Thank you. I always enjoy the... <laughs> you you got to love the Fulton Sheen Institute, one of my <laughs> heroes, Fulton Sheen. Indeed. Well, Ted, let's just let's jump right in. The, one of the things I, I wanted to, to talk to you about in a major way is um, the... Uh, reported apparitions in, from 1961 to 1965 in Garabandal, Spain. And one of the things that's been popping up for me is, and I get questions on this, is, is the warning close? Is the warning close? And some people don't even know what the warning is, but Garabandal really seems to have been the first of the, the major apparitions of the 20th century that put that in a very, you know, uh, uh, a, a big spotlight on it, and it had a lot of specifics about it. So, um, but I would like to just step back and allow you to help us to understand just a little bit about the apparitions themselves, because the church has not given an official stance on it, uh, which means that it's still open for devotion. People can, um, you know, there, there's nothing that prevents people from uh, reading the messages, applying them to their own life. Um, so why don't you give us a little bit of background about Garabandal? Well, let's say out of, out of all of the apparitions that I followed now over 40 years, Garabandal is actually my pet. So let's put it out there. I mean, I've been to most of the major apparition sites literally in the world, probably with the exception of Akita, Japan. But Garabandal, my first trip there was actually 1994 when we brought a uh, hundred people. We had two buses. And, you know, it's in the Cantabrian Mountains, the Bay of Biscay, about 20, 25 minutes from Santander in northern um, uh, Spain. And it's where the Blessed Mother appeared to about 2,000 times to four young girls. Uh, three of them had the last name of Gonzalez, and they were unrelated, 11 and 12 years old. So the apparitions began in 1961, and they ended in 1965. And as I say, about 2,000 times the Blessed Mother appeared to these four young children, in which had some things, as you just said, that had never been said before in any major apparition site in the world. <clears throat> we know that there was a tremendous amount of interest from all over Europe, people who went there, it, you know, it, 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 it's a natural amphitheater to where you can look down on what is where there's supposed to be a miracle and the nine pines to where you can look down on these. But I think it had a tremendous number of very well no, devotees. Um, uh, Padre Pio was very much a believer in it and even met with Conchita before he died. And he he actually gave her what is it when you when you put in a a tomb is it a mantilla? He actually he wanted his mantilla to be given to to Conchita when he died, and he touched the rosaries and he and he blessed Conchita. We know that Pope Paul VI was very sympathetic to it. 
We know that um, Mother Teresa was actually a good friend of Conchita and was very supportive of it. John Paul II with Cardinal, uh, then Father Jeevish, now Cardinal Jeevish was very supportive. So it, it's had a lot of um, controversy around it as well. Um, but it, it's, it's some phenomenal things that took place there with the, probably the best known, I guess we could go in a lot of different directions here. And sure. we've got limited time to go over, you know, all of these issues. So we'll maybe have to focus in on what the main messages are. Sure. And, the, and the main message is that there was uh, the Blessed Mother again, uh, where these were contemporaneous um, with what was going on with the three sessions of Vatican II. And the main message is about the Eucharist and the priesthood fidelity to the Eucharist and the priesthood. And it's like all of the other apparition sites, do whatever he tells you. There's nothing too extraordinary. But there was a lot of ecstatic and ecstasy around it that were confusing to a lot of people. And it confused them the way the girls could really nearly walk going up a mountain and barely touch ground. Uh, they could walk backwards very, very fast. And but there's the the thing that it's most known for is that at some date in the future, there is to be this thing called the warning. In Spanish, it's called the aviso, or another word is the illumination of conscience or a correction of conscience. And this is where we will see the state of our soul as God would see it at judgment, and it's going to be worldwide, every single person in the world will actually experience this at the same time to where literally it said planes will stop in the air. It's going to be a true miraculous event that has never been seen or never been done virtually in the history of the world. I mean, if you want to take a look at the parting of the Red Sea with Moses, that's a pretty big event by any standard but it was very localized to literally that part of the world. This event, this correction of conscience is going to be for every single person in the world. And the reason it's been so prescient and prevalent for me is I've always felt as you look at the world going in the direction it's going, the only thing that can correct the conscience of the world will be something this fantastically big. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything else can correct this conscience. Another word is a judgment in miniature. And there's been certain people like Anna Marie Tiagi, um, St. Edmund Campion, um, Maria Esperanza of Venezuela, where they have spoken about similar things using even similar language. Father Stef Stefano Gobi of the Marian Movement of Priests literally had a message given from Garabandal while he was there. And it was, again, it was, it, it was, it coincided with what the messages of Garabandal were, the importance of the priesthood and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And then a... after, after that is going to be uh, within one year, a great miracle. Now, exactly what that is, there, there's data points, but nobody is sure exactly what that is. But you can look at some of the data points of like Sister Faustina, uh, and, and there has been, you know, where people have kind of given a little tidbit of what would be a great miracle, which is an ultimate act of mercy for the world. So why? Let's ask, why is this? And the why has to do with this is God's ultimate act of mercy for a world totally off its axis. Indeed. And as things are unraveling so quickly at this very moment, I mean, the last time that I had you on, we were talking, I mean, Russia was on the border of Ukraine. We talked about what that could, what that may look like. And then what has, when we look at what has happened since, um, it, it, for me, it kind of gave uh, some um, a pause 
looking at some of the things that we spoke about and blessed Elena Vallello and, you know, will they go further? Like, where is this going to go? But now things are, like, are so moving so fast. And then there's been the call to consecrate Russia um, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And literally right before we started this recording, um, you had mentioned to me, because I, I wasn't watching the, my phone for the last two hours, that that was just announced. Pope Francis is going to go out and he's going to, or not go out, but he's going to consecrate um, Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, this is, like, things are moving really fast. And my, that's why my attention, and in my own prayer, I keep being drawn back to things that I haven't given a lot of attention to in recent years. One is Medjugorje. I had a big conversion through there. And then also... Garibandal, two apparition sites that remain open for people to, uh, you know, to follow if they wish, and just be like the church, be open but cautious, but you know a tree by its fruits. Um, and I find that there seems to be a lot of crossover with certain things, like, because in Medjugorje you have these ten secrets, and one of those would be a permanent sign that would be left there. Garibandal speaks of a permanent sign that would be at the site of the pines. Um, and I've been there, so it's like it's like the only other place other than the little town is like this this pine area. Other than that, it's like cliffs almost. It just you're high up in the mountains. Oh, so I didn't know you'd been there. What year were you there? I was there um, right around this time, a little bit later, uh, ninety five. Oh, really? You yeah, were really I, early. Yeah, I was. Wow. I was in Austria. I was studying in Austria from with Franciscan University, and for our ten day trip, a group of us just head on out to, um, we went west, <laughs> and we, we, our goal was Fatima, but we were going to, we were determined to figure out Garabandal, and if, man, as you know, having been there, it is not, an, it's not on any beaten path, it's, it's, uh, it's a miracle we made it, we hiked up that last part of the mountain, and then there's this little town, and we had no arrangements, so it, it was about as raw of a place that I would say it was like unchanged from when things took place there than any other place that I've been to, you know, so. You're absolutely right. When, when, when Garabandal started in 1961, there were only 300 people and they were literally harvesting hay with scythes. And there wasn't literally in the village a motor with a moving part. Right. That was 1961. I was there for the first time. Um, in 94, where we led a group, and we were very early in that, and it was amazing how remote it was. And we went back in 2017, we were there, we went to Fatima for the 100th anniversary, and then we continued to Santiago, and then went to Santander, and, and we ended up at Lourdes. But it, the, the village, quote, hadn't changed much. And that's what was most stunning. The church was still very, very tiny. Now, for what is supposed to be a major apparition site with a grand miracle or a great miracle taking place, you would think it would be really built up. But I think that's all part of the story. I think what's going to happen there is so out of our realm of really fully understanding that um, we're going to look back on it as truly miraculous. There were two bathrooms in, in, in now let, let's go from when you were there in 95 to 2017, two bathrooms, that's it. Wow. I mean, so they're talking about millions journeying there and it's not going to be built up. I don't see, it isn't the big destination site like a Guadalupe or a Lourdes or, or a Fatima. It's not built up and it won't be. No, gee, yeah, it, 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 the way the topography is of that place too. It's, it can't be. I mean, we, like I said, we there was one road up when I was there, that I and and we hiked Still most is. of it. Okay, so and, I mean, this is a long time ago, and um, and I remember, yeah, very vividly, and it was such a one of the most unique experiences I've had because we weren't there very long, uh, maybe a day and a half tops because we were en route to Fatima. And, I, and quite honestly, we were kind of nervous. <laughs> Can we get from there to Fatima? We couldn't even find our way back down to the train area. And, um, but, you know, there was always something about the, um, that place because it was fresh in my mind back then. And I, I just often wondered, like, uh, 
talk about an obscure place. Our Lady chooses interesting places all, all the time to appear. But this one is so obscure with such a major message that has seemed to, I don't want to say drop off the face of the earth, but Medjugorje, basically, it's, it seems like that's replaced Garamandal because it's a s- similar message, and it's definitely, I mean, more people have been able to go to Medjugorje, and, um, and of course, with these other secrets that are out there, it almost seems like, I don't say it will eclipse Garabandal, but I'm sort of like, where does Garabandal fit in all of this? Because the messages are strong. And with the warning, there's a lot of specifics. Like it will happen on a it will it will happen on a Thursday on a feast of a Eucharistic. That's martyr. no, that that's the miracle. That's oh, that's the miracle. the miracle. I thought okay, that was yeah, the warning. There, there, there isn't there isn't a, a great deal of information of exactly when the warning is. There's fairly uh, not great specificity, but there's a lot more. The warning is going to take place um, in a, at some point in time that nobody knows, and only one of the visionaries knew when it was. Or and, and um, I forget which the one that died, and that was in Haverhill, Massachusetts, not Mary Lowly. Oh, that's um, the one I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, I think. I think. Um, it's Jacinta, yeah, I think it was, and there's another one. In- Conchita, Conchita. Uh, yeah, maybe Mary Lowley. Uh, she was in Haverhill, Mass. I'm, I'm forgetting right now. She died in 2009. She had lupus and was ill. But we know she knew the year of the warning, and it's Conchita who knows the day of the miracle. And everybody gets these mixed up: the warning and the miracle. When the warning happens, the operative word here is within. I mean, I've been around this material since now the late 70s, and people always get them mixed up um, in, in within one year. So it doesn't necessarily have to be in the same calendar year, but within an illegal sense is 365, within 365 days. And then this great miracle takes place. It's going to be on a Thursday, 8.30 p.m. Spanish time, between the months of March, April, May, and June, and let me tell you why a lot of people discount June, because it was um, there's been a lot of speculation that it's uh, May, and it's going to be on the feast of a young Eucharistic martyr in the church. It's um, it, it's going to take place, as I said, at 8:30 Spanish time, and it's going to be an event that the Anybody who is there will be healed. There, again, as an apparition site, nobody has ever said, everybody who is there will be healed. I mean, what a great promise. This is, as I say, the great act of mercy. You can see the miracle, you can televise the miracle, but you will not be able to touch it. Hmm. And so there's been a bit of a parlor game, you know, March, April, May, or June, and people... Um, discount June a lot, but I, you know, I have a tape where Conchita was a fairly young woman on Irish TV, and she literally said March, April, May, or June. Interesting. And it'll be between the, between the 8th and the 16th of a month, and it will, it will coincide with, a, with a, an ecclesial event in the church. Now, you, so you've got some data points there, but what could be the ecclesial event? Could it be the proclamation of the dogma? Of the dogma, I've I mean, heard that, yeah. The Fifth Marian dogma. Okay, so that's in the mix, but you've had all sorts of people, you know, looking to, you know, pinpoint the day of the miracle, or, or the or, because you got a better shot at that than the warning, because you know, versus that's just one year. But you've got the data points on on the miracle side, and and you know th- there's speculation what it could be. It, you know it's why I put on the cover of the Thunder Justice. Uh, it, it's from Saint Faustina, where she talked about the act of mercy would be literally like like a Shekinah glory or a Shekinah glory. Um, it would be where where the wounds of Jesus were rays would go out to the entire world. And the Pope will see the miracle from wherever he is in the world. Hmm. Padre Pio had had seen the miracle before he died. 
and I don't know if you, you know the priest by the name of Father Andreu, the Jesuit. Is this the one who's, he, who was yelled out, miracle, miracle, and then he, I think he died on the way home? From miracle, that miracle, miracle. And he said, today has been the happiest day of my life. And then he simply died. He just literally collapsed and died right in a car. Hmm. Miracle, mir milagro, milagro, milagro. And then he said, today has been the happiest day of my life and then died. He hmm. saw it. So it's going to be a fantastic event. And, and, and the reason I've always been most excited about Garibandal, it, it, it actually um, is, is it's so spiritual. It, it's, it's such a great act of mercy. It, it can turn around this tide of collapse that the world is seeing to where people could gain some sense of formation and faith. Mm -hmm. Because we're so far off balance right now, unless something happens of this magnitude, I'm not sure we can come back to any sort of normalcy anymore. Yeah, I agree. And it seems like the, the imminence of something like this uh, is... You know, it really has my senses kind of on on hyper alert because we are very realistically so close to just one thing uh, triggering a nuclear conflict, and you know at that point things could get so out of hand really fast that it's only something like this where you think like God would intervene to and, and whether it would be for or after I don't know. But it, it would seem to make sense. Hopefully, it would happen before something like that would begin. Um, but to you know, to really put a halt and allow mankind to make a, really a final decision, and that's how I've often understood this this warning, this illumination of conscience. I think uh, I think Conchita described that you would know since you're the expert on this. She called it a, a a global correction of conscience. I think she used that phrase. Is that did she say that? I thought that was an interesting way to put um, that. Like everyone I don't will have an opportunity. I don't know if she used the word global correction. You know, it, it's been a correction of conscience, an illumination of conscience, mm -hmm. uh, um, a, a correction, um, a judgment in miniature. People have used different terms. But the, the word uh, in Spanish is a viso, which means a warning. Mm. Okay. Translates a little bit loose, and, and that, that's their word. That we, we, the English translation is the warning. To me, it's the ultimate act of God's mercy and love for mankind to, on a global basis. No matter who you are, you know, it's not a day of death, but it, 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 it's a day that can shock people. Uh, mm -hmm. I did a film called Prophecy in the New Times, and I ended up putting. Uh, because I have written so extensively over 30 years uh, on the warning, and as I'm just finishing up two chapters for a book that cumulatively the warning is 20 pages and the miracle is 12 with some updated information on, on issues that are going on in the world. Of, you know, the Pope may be going to uh, Russia be around the time of the warning. And, and it took me two days to run down the footnote on that. The only person in the world who said that was a, a, a German writer by the name of Albrecht Weber, W-E-B-E-R. And he had sent his book um, to Pope John Paul II, and he sent back a little inscription in it with his signature. And Cardinal Jeevish had said to continue to promote it. And so... Um, there's just going to be so much enthusiasm and excitement after this where, you know, churches will be filled. They'll be going to confession like never before. Priests won't even be able to leave the confession. Mm -hmm. It explains the ills in our society. That's the reason I've been so excited about it my whole life. It explains how we can correct. What's interesting <laughs> from my understanding uh, on the the warning and other things that have been talked about in Garibandal and in other apparitions uh, is that the warning is this opportunity, it's kind of this final opportunity for mankind to turn back to God. But it will precede not only just a major sign, but a chastisement that will come. And so you kind of wonder, well, if that's coming, I'll say, was the warning a failure? 
Of course, it won't be, but um, it's interesting that I've seen in that connection of things, and that might be more, perhaps that's more Medjugorje that, that speaks of it that way. I don't know. Um, can you comment on that can, on that progression? Because it seems like there's the warning, the permanent sign, and then a series of chastisements that would come that can be mitigated when people pray and they turn back. At one point, could even be um, completely removed. But my understanding is that things that so many things have happened, and there hasn't been enough conversion that it will happen. But certain aspects have been lessened. What are your What are your thoughts? Well, you, 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 there, that's a real mouthful. I mean, <laughs> the, the issue because you know you, you mentioned about um, the, the ten secrets where there will be a permanent sign even at, at Medjugorje. There seems to be a lot of overlapping data from things that have frankly been found out or leaked or people who have pieced together, and that's very very legitimate. But each of these stands on its own. Mm. The gun goes off with a warning. Now, I, I mentioned, I know, I know many people now, probably as many as 20 people that have experienced a life review, which is even another word. And in that life review, uh, one of them I put in a film that I did called Prophecy in the New Times. It was on a documentary on the major apparition sites. I don't know if you ever remember the uh, the movie The French Connection with Gene Hackman, Popeye Doyle. Oh, yes. Popeye oh, Doyle. Yeah. He was the he was the uh, involved in uh, you know in narcotics, trying mm -hmm. to get narcotics in New York City, and they made a movie out of it. It was a good movie. And uh, this man worked uh, on that detail. His name was Dick Bingle. This is a very public story. And, and he told it all over the world, so I'm not telling anything out of school here. And he even did it on film for me. And when he, he had been kind of a bad guy, he hadn't been a good husband. He had been in the narcotics trade in New York City as a policeman. But then he didn't necessarily go bad, but he said he wasn't a good cop either. And then he, he went to New York and it was boats and every, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Miami. And then it became boats and that whole lifestyle of drinking and everything in Miami. He experienced the warning. He was a big guy. He was about 6'4", probably 280. Big heavy set guy. And when he experienced the warning, having been a bad, guy, a bad boy, he literally, he fell on his kitchen room floor, his kitchen floor. And he said he couldn't get up for five hours. He was in tears and remorse and repentance. He, his whole life had gone before him. And what the warning is, is all of your sins you see before you in a progression, sins of omission, commission. And these are the stories of people who have had life review. I know two priests who have even experienced it. Every single story is nearly identical. It changes their life beyond anything you can even imagine. There hasn't been a single person that I've spoken to over the last 30 years that has not had a radical alteration in life. And Dick Bingold, as one of these men, literally became a missionary in South Africa after where he had a greater conversion even at Medjugorje. And we had a pilgrim statue of Medjugorje that traveled all around the world. We gave him for his exclusive use that he brought with him. And it, so here is a man. He saw all of his life go like a slow motion picture. Like think of your iPhone where you kind of just go through the photos and you see everything that you did. And it's not necessarily all bad, but the ways that you hurt people. And as I say, omission and commission and where there was grievous sin went slow. And Dick said he was on his kitchen room floor for five hours in tears. That's the impact it had on his life. That's the warning. Wow. And that's why it's going to correct the conscience of the world. So no matter whether one has confessed his sins or not, they're going to still see this life review versus things that were never brought before the Lord. Is that correct? Well, you know, I mean, if you look at the promise of, of divine mercy, right. uh, you know, you know, I'm That's not what I'm thinking sure. Of. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, Dick, from everything Dick ever told me, he hadn't been to confession in an awful long time. Mm -hmm. But it's not a day of death. 
and it's going to be hard for many, many people. But uh, the visionaries at Garabandal said it's not going to be hard for many people, but it will be hard for many as well. Hmm. Hard for many, not hard for many. Hmm. Depending on the state of your soul, as God would judge it at judgment, and you will have no answer. You're around such love. You're around such compassion. You're around such knowledge of who you are. You have no rebuttal. That's why this is going to be such a fantastic event for the world. But you mentioned the warning. that The gun goes off with the warning. Then we know within one year, you know, March, April, May, or June, but, you know, on the 13th of the month on a Thursday. So the money is, you know, people are now looking at their calendars. When's a Thursday on the 13th of the month? Uh, so they're looking at their calendars and you can go out so many years. But people now have been trying to pick these dates I now, know. literally all the way back from the 60s. And guess what? Nobody's been right. Yeah, It hasn't I know. been like people will think. Yet Albrecht Weber, you know, he just wrote, recently wrote that the Pope would go to Moscow. And when I, I, I hadn't heard that, and I, I've got two bankers boxes of books with everything ever written about Garabandal. The, the Garabandal magazine with Joey Lomangino and his wife was called Needles for many years. I have all of the old needles. I knew Joey, spoke to him. I actually, Mother Angelica once called me up and asked if I could, could get uh, her Joey's number because she took a great interest. When Mother Angelica was healed with her legs, do you know where she went to give thanks? Garabandal. Oh. She I had no No, she was hurt as a young woman. I know she or, was healed. Yeah, and she had those metal braces mm -hmm. on her legs. She went to Garabandal and gave thanks. Interesting. Her most her most popular show in all of EWTN history was when she had Joey Lomangino on. Now That's Joey my next was question. Blonde. That's my next Joey question. Was, what happened with that promise? <laughs> well, it, well, that's say there's controversy around this. I mean, you know, I see the inconsistencies, but I got to tell you the Joey story. So um, Mother Angelica had gone there and w when she had Joey on, she took a tremendous interest in Garabandal. And we talked about it for many, many hours. We, she was even a guest in our home for three days uh, right around the year 2000 before she got ill. She came up to speak at our week of prayer and fasting, and she stayed, and we talked a lot about Garabandal. And she, she saw it the way I did, that it could correct the conscience of the world. And so uh, Joey was on her show. He was blind. Now, Joey's a good Italian boy from New York. He's the New Yorker, and he was a garbage man. You know, he had a garbage business. That's, that's New York. And now she was she was a, an Ohio, uh, an Italian. Her name was Rita Rizzo. She, so she got along with Joey really well. So Joey's on her show and she says to him, hey, Joey, when you look at Garabandal, what do you see? How do you see it? And he, and he says to her, hey, I don't know if you noticed, mother, but I'm blind. I don't see much. <laughs> you know? and, and, and she just lost it. You know, it, it's in her annals. If, I don't know if you know, mother, but I don't see much. And so, but she took a big interest in it. So, but, you know, then you've, so then you've got the miracle, which is going to happen at time certain within 365 days. Mm -hmm. Now, where these chastisements and everything fits in, you know, I mean, let's face it, if you were in the Ukraine right now and, and you're, you're on a bus from all the way in the east, possibly all the way to Austria or Hungary, you know, with the clothes on your back, you will think it's a chastisement. Or if you're in Sarajevo during the war in Bosnia and mm -hmm. Sniper Alley with 50 cows coming over your head, where today to this very day you see a lot of the buildings with big pock marks. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, you'd think you're in the chastisement. So does the chastisement have to be a tsunami from, you know, um, the Canary Islands taking out the whole East Coast? You know, the world is in a chastisement. There's so much a difficulty with the pandemic, with death, 
with war, the Ukraine situation, poverty, illness, disease. So, you know, these things, in my opinion, they're just continually gradual. So when everybody, I think, thinks you have to literally have the Red Sea, you know, hit Cape Cod or something to have a chastisement. These are incremental, gradual, and incredibly destructive to people and to economies of the world for their well-being and welfare. Yeah, for sure. But there will be, obviously, major events of that will be a chastisement, either through natural or other things. I mean, right now, the way I've always understood this, especially now, is God is allowing man to live out the, the fruits of, of rejecting him, and this is where it all leads. And the time when we will see more intervention will be, I think, beginning with the warning. I mean, this is just me, I'm, but I've, I've contemplated these things for a while, too, um, to give mankind kind of a chance to, like, what's your final side? Because there's going to be many, like Pharaoh, who was given 10 opportunities, to, you know, who saw the power of God, and his heart, his, his, his heart got hardened even more. Um, but obviously, before the, the time of the triumph comes, this world will have undergone a massive conversion and purification um, for that to take place. And so it's like, we haven't seen anything yet from, and, and like you're saying, what we have seen, or if you're in these positions, if you're in these war areas, well, it doesn't get any worse than that, because that's the hell of war. Um, but just to shift gears on that for a second, um, when you're looking at, uh, let me, I'll simplify it just for the sake of time as I'm looking at the clock here. What is the big takeaway you think that we should have from Garabandal? You've mentioned it being, of course, with the warning and, and a great act of mercy. You talk about the priesthood and the Eucharist. What should we take away in the sense of its relevance for right now? It seems like it's, it's coming back for a reason to our attention. What's the relevance now? I, I think it's the relevance. I mean, every culture at their point in time, you know, every single adult thinks the generation coming up behind it's on its way to hell. Um, and, and that's been literally since Socrates and Plato talking like that. But where we're at now, when you start getting into accepting transgender and expecting and, and, and literally being told that if, 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 you, if you step out of bounds and, you, and a woman wants to be called a man or vice versa, and literally go in, a man going in a little girl's bathroom, and that's acceptable in our culture, I think the relevance now is more than ever because we are seriously off the rail. I did an article recently on, on Romans 1 to try to understand literally, uh, uh, what, let's just call it a progressive mind of where they are accepting of, of critical race theory and all of the complete lunacy. And the only thing I could come up with in terms of the relevancy of understanding people with these views and expected to and not only accept them, but promote them and allow them and especially if you're in a big corporation with this diversity or in government where you have to abide by this lunacy. Roman, Romans 1 is the best I've ever come up with, where St. Paul now is toward, towards the end of his life. He's had all of his mission journeys. He had quite, a, quite an experience of understanding God with Damascus Road. And people forget, Paul went off to the desert of Arabia, to be discipled for three years after he was knocked off his donkey or his horse, whatever it was. And as a Roman citizen, he could have actually had a horse. But um, the relevancy now, it's a great, great question. We are so far off tr track, it's going to take an event like this to correct us. So heaven is responding in kind, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Mm -hmm. And um, where Paul was in Romans 1, if, if you, if different versions will be possibly not say this. I, I got this is in the Jerusalem, which is a Catholic edition. St. Paul gives one description to the pagans. And so I don't say we're Democrat or, or progressive. 
or even socialist now. We are absolutely communist and we're pagan with the things that we're allowing. Um, where the Senate, the United States Senate, missed by having two votes to literally, as a Senate just a few weeks ago, allow uh, once a baby is born to kill it. That's not progressive. That's pagan. That's worse than communist. That's mm -hmm. pagan. So Paul writes literally in Romans 1 where there's like 23 descriptions. He's near the end of his life. He's going to be martyred <clears throat> in the not too distant future at Trey Fontani. He's writing with great alacrity. He's writing, writing with great wisdom. And he literally says it's like he's gone out to a bar and he's had two beers with his buddies. And St. Paul says, the guy's got no brains. If you, if you read Romans 1 and look at the description of a pagan, we meet them in not only the West, but in much of the world. Mm -hmm. We're pagan. We are not socialists. We are not progressives. We're not Democrats. We're far beyond that now. And that's why I have always been so excited more about Garabandal than others. It's interesting that you mentioned Romans. I was just thinking of that when you were speaking, because um, I remember, uh, this was a long time ago, this is probably back in the 90s, uh, Dr. Scott Hahn gave a, um, a course, he recorded a, a whole series on Romans, just audio, and I was using it as a resource when I was doing some teaching on it. And he was commenting on the end of the chapter, of chapter one, all of these various sins, and how the one thing that was... Uh, Behind it all was the fact that, depending on your translation, they'll say, because they failed to acknowledge God. In other words, but they failed, they failed to give thanks to God, and that, led, that leads to a moral deterioration. And then he made a comment that really uh, struck me hard, was people say sins, these sins have existed since the beginning. I mean, look at the Bible in Genesis. These sins were all there, and it's true. But the difference, though, he says, is that when a sin is, I'm paraphrasing, uh, woven into, the, into society and normalized in society, those, that society is not in its final years, it's not in its final days, it is in its final hours. And that's right. And that's where we are right now, and like you said, maybe bringing all this together, that's why we are desperate for a warning or for the warning that's been, maybe that's the big pause in the book of Revelation. It speaks in the midst of all of this, then there's this silence and there's just pause. Maybe that's what that's referring to, because this is, a, like you said, this is going to be, and I've heard it referenced this way by others, the greatest act of God, miracle of God on earth since the resurrection of Christ. And so... To tie this together, now that we're at the very end, I'm just going to see if you can summarize this in a minute or two. It's kind of a parenthesis, but we were talking about earlier, <laughs> since we're always talking about dates and things, and we're, uh, at the time of this recording, we are, what, March 15th, and so we've got the Feast of St. The, the Joseph. Of March. And, yeah, the Ides of March, and we've got the uh, Feast of St. Joseph coming up, uh, or St. Patrick, and then St. Joseph. Um, but we have this... We have March 18th, and this number 18 pops up of, uh, out of significance because um, Mariana of Bejigoria, she uh, she spoke about this, and you alluded to it in a, one of our previous uh, conversations of this the, the significance of the number 18, and it had nothing to do with Mariana's birthday, I think it is, or, or when she has the apparition on the 18th, is it? I'm trying to—you can correct me on all that, but— she says, no, has, there's a deeper significance that will be known later on. And I, I wonder if that has anything to do with the warning. But that's, that's well, it, it, it may. I mean, I'll tell you how important the 18th is for me. Every single, get a, every single year I get my new day timer. I've got the big one that you kind of write in. The first thing I do when I get my new day timer is I go to March 18th and I put Merjana on it. <laughs> <laughs> and because it's it be what I find it fascinating. First of all, March eighteenth is Merjana's birthday, and yet here she is as a really young girl, 
um, with, with all of the things that are thrown at you, with the world coming to your door and all of the confusion and the changes and the turbulence and chaos, as well as all of the graces that come with that. And, and so the Blessed Mother comes now. She went through the Bosnia War. Her mother died before the father. The father had a stroke. Her brother-in-law um, died in the war. Marco's brother died, which is her husband. And she has a tremendous sense of humor. And uh, I, went, uh, I read uh, Sean Bloomfield's book, My Heart Will Triumph. And right at the very, very end, the last page, the last few paragraphs, I enjoyed the book. It wasn't necessarily an autobiography, but there was a lot of stories in it. And she opens up literally telling the story of how if anybody doubts that I'm sane, nobody has been probed, uh, probed and, and, and pricked with pins like I've been. So, yes, I'm sane, but you may not be, but I am because I've been proven to be sane. But on the so here it's Merjana's birthday. In the Blessed Mother, with all of these trials in her life and, and things that are going on, on not one single occasion did the Blessed Mother ever come to her and say, Happy Birthday. Mm. So, in other words, there's something much, much bigger. And in the very last page of the book, it, she, she talks about, it's almost the punchline of My Heart Will Triumph, where she talks about, you know, it's like cleaning, cleaning your kitchen. You take everything out of your cupboards, you put the chairs up on the table, you scrub the floor, you clean everything, and then the place is a mess. And then when you put everything back, it's all in order. And the inference is very, very clear. It's not a metaphor or anything else. It's very clear that there's going to be turbulence before these events take place. It's, in other words, your chaos is in kitchen. And it, it, it's it's absolutely a mess, and then you put everything back together, and it, it's in order. Wow. But the so think of it. So the 18th, she said, you'll know why when it happens, but there's no indication specifically why. To the Jews, the 18th is a big number. It you know because you could look at some of the at the Blessed Mother appeared 18 times uh, to Bernadette Subaru. The big, big messages of October one in uh, Ju uh, the eight uh, October eighteenth, nineteen sixty one at Garabandal. The cup is filling up, and then June eighteenth, nineteen sixty five. The cup is flowing over because people didn't obey what was asked. And what came out of Vatican II at those contemporaneous? We saw a tremendous attack on the Eucharist and the priesthood from a more progressive element in the church that wanted to bring the church in a different direction. So that was going on during Vatican II. So if that's what it meant, I don't know. But she never mentioned it specifically as having anything to do with Vatican II. But we know over 100,000 religious left the religious life after Vatican II because they didn't agree with the direction the church was going to go. They didn't want to be a part of it. Hmm. Priests and um, nuns left the church. There were over a hundred thousand that left at, right after that. Hmm. Well, I think that kind of brings us full circle at the end here. That's uh, that with all these major apparitions have uh, spoken <clears throat> of, uh, just tie into that famous um, uh, dream of Don Bosco of the of the two columns, the one with the higher one with the Eucharist and the shorter one of Our Our Lady Help of Christians, and the Church anchoring itself to both, chaining itself to both, because in the end, that's the only thing that's going to save us. There's no political salvation. It's nobody's going to come back and save the world <laughs> at this point. You know, it's uh, this is all about... Um, this is about our Lord and His Blessed Mother, and they're going to... They're going to do things that we haven't yet imagined and i think this, it's a glorious time to be alive and i um i think it's important taking everything that you said to heart taking us thank you th through taking us through the the messages and the significance of garabandal because i think it it should prompt us all if we're not if we haven't been to confession recently get to confession <laughs> definitely before these things happen it'll be better for you um and also to draw closer to the eucharist 
um, and spend as much time as we can because we're all of these messages keep pointing us back there. If we want to really simplify them instead of getting wrapped up in the minutia, which the Satan can use as a distraction as well, just getting caught up in that and not actually going out and transforming the world and your family, especially your family, um, you know, is to anchor ourselves to the Eucharist and our Blessed Mother. So I'm praying, as, as we learned right before, that Pope Francis apparently is that he's, he's going to consecrate Russia. I'm all for that. And I think that nothing but good things will come by that act. So let's, let's continue to pray for that. And Ted, I want to thank you for joining me again. I want to um, encourage everybody to check out uh, Ted's latest book that he's been, that I, I mentioned it before, Diabolical Disorientation. I think I still have it up here. I can put uh, right there in the middle. There it is. Um, this is going to give you, it's a series of, of articles and essays that he's done that really give you in a nice, concise format um, great, uh, uh, I would say, things to reflect on that give you a um, great elaboration, I think, on what's going on today. So um, as, as the demonic grows, confusion grows, division grows, this is going to help us to be more anchored where we need to be in our mind, and then hopefully that'll translate into our spiritual life. So thanks, Ted, for joining me. I'd love to have you back again. Um, especially after the consecration, whenever I don't know when they scheduled it. Did he schedule it? Yes, March twenty fifth. Oh, oh, yeah, it was scheduled <laughs> March twenty fifth. Well, we can speak about Garamendal if we, if we yeah. want to do another six hours today. We could do that now. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. listen, the way you just ended it, the twin pillars of Don Bosco, even Benedict the Sixteenth talked about the sh the ship being the church being tossed stem to stern. And with the twin pillars of the Eucharist and the Blessed Mother, that's where we're at. That's going to that's our foundation right now for us going forward. And you just said it's about the rubrics, and it's about the fundamentals of the faith. Sticking to those, it, it, her messages are the same worldwide. Do whatever he tells you. It's just that simple. It is that simple. Well, with that, I'm going to uh, say thanks again and. Uh, Ask everyone to remember what Our Lady said at Fatima, and, and really the consistent refrain of her modern apparitions is pray the rosary every day for peace and an end to the war. Now it's especially relevant um, as we see things breaking out. And this is it's never too late to get your life back to God. So do it now. Uh, take all these beautiful things that Ted has shared with us. And uh, I can't wait to have you back again, Ted. Thank you very much. I always enjoy it. All right. God bless you. Sister Lucia said that the triumph of the Immaculate Heart begins and, and is extended with every single family who consecrates themselves and places themselves in the refuge of Mary's Immaculate Heart. So this is not something that's just out in the future. It starts right now. And then there will be an ultimate culmination as we get through all of these things that Ted has helped us to understand better um, with the warning permanent sign. We are in for the greatest, uh, the greatest events of all history, I think, since the resurrection of Christ. So let's be strong. God bless you, and thanks again for joining us for another episode of The Catholic Patriot. Right is right if nobody is right. Wrong is wrong if everybody is wrong. And believe me, in this error-infested world, what we really need is a church and an authority that is right, not when the world is right, but one that is right when the world is wrong. Never in history has the prayer of the rosary been more needed to save our families, our countries, and defeat the evils of the world than now. The Fulton Sheen Institute worked closely with the Roma Rosary to develop the most unique, beautiful, and meaningful rosary that was inspired by Fulton Sheen's World Mission Rosary. This special handcrafted rosary continues Sheen's passion to support the mission of the church to evangelize the entire world. Each decade of the rosary has a different color, which corresponds with a different continent. Yellow for Asia, red for the Americas, white for Europe, blue for the nations of Oceania, and green for Africa. Each Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary 
comes with a set of four pure essential oil blends that have been chosen for their therapeutic and theological significance. These blends correspond to the four mysteries of the rosary. Simply choose the oil for the mystery of the day, drop a small drop in the palm of your hand, and massage the oil over the surface, being sure to catch the lava beads. You're good to go and your prayer will linger longer with these beautiful aromatic notes. Every Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary you purchase supports our mission to fight the battle for the hearts and souls of the Christian family and lead our world back to God. So visit the Fulton Sheen Institute's store and pick up your beautiful Fulton Sheen Aroma Rosary today. Get one for you, your family members, and your close friends, and don't forget your pastor. Thank you so much for your prayers and your support.